Today's guest is an ordained pastor, storyteller, author, public speaker, TV producer, TV talent, and much, much more. He has had two near-death experiences and told the tale of the first one in his best-selling book, Heaven is Beautiful, How Dying Taught Me That Death is Just the Beginning. Please give a huge coit welcome to Peter Panagor. Hi, Peter, and welcome to Coitcast. Hi, Coit. Thanks for having me. No worries. It's an honour to have you here. So thank you ever so much for uh, allotting some time for me. Thank you ever so much. Um, who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? All that good stuff. Oh, in brief. My in name brief, yeah. <laughs> my, my name is Peter Patagor. I'm a near-death experiencer. I live on the northern coast of the United States near Canada in Maine on the end of a peninsula on the end of another peninsula sticking out in the ocean. I live here because of the beauty of the place, and I'm attracted to beautiful places primarily because of my near-death experience. It, I was uh, raised in Massachusetts, which is south of here and outside a city. Uh, I grew up Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox, but I started having what I now understand were mystical experiences as a child that I kept to myself. I had a series of them in my life. I come from a professional uh, family that was formerly blue collar on one side. Mm -hmm. And so education was a big part of my life. I went to a private Catholic school where I read the Bible every year, one chapter, one gospel of the Bible. But I was a, by the time I had my near death experience, I was a pot smoking, acid dropping hippie and Whoa. with a, with a deep spirituality and a practice of meditation. Wow. That is a, a an amazing start. So there's a couple of things I want to latch on to there. Obviously, you've mentioned that you had those experiences in the early formative years. I'd love to touch on those. And I think, does your near-death experience relate to them directly or are they separate entities? They didn't relate to it. They, they each individual each individual experience relates to the previous experiences so ah, it wasn't okay. until i had but it wasn't until i had my nde my first one that they became contextualized for me up until that point i didn't i couldn't see them as clearly as i could see after yeah no that makes sense there's been experiences in my life where you you have something and then it only makes sense later on um let's let's start right back at those formative ones because i think then that would build up the picture like it happened to you so that would help us to do the same process would you mind doing that no, no, not at all. So I, I'm going to count them up. There was five, six-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, uh, 17, 20. So there might have been four. And the first one happened when I was five. I was in a maple tree, a small uh, deciduous tree that turns colors in the fall. And it was mm -hmm. in uh, probably September Long story short, I was five years old. I was hiding on my sisters, so they couldn't find me. I was going to jump down and scare them. But as I sat there, the leaves were blowing in the wind with the two-tone. The, the top side was shiny dark green. The bottom side was a muted light green. And as they flickered, I became mesmerized by them. And as I watched them, I became entranced. And as, the, as I became entranced by them, I got really sort of sleepy and relaxed. And as that happened a huge noise happened behind me. I was leaning against the tree trunk. And this noise was the sound of a waterfall. It was very, very loud. And it was announcing itself. And as it announced itself, it scooped me out of my body and traveled me up this, well, now I, I call it a, an elevator shaft or a super space highway uh, elevator uh, but it was an entity that collected me and took me into through the atmosphere. I could see the little boy in the tree. I could see the tree. I could see the house. I could see the country. I could came up to the edge of the atmosphere. And I was inside this entity that then became like a bubble inside of a, a darkness that was like velvet. Uh, but it extended it in every direction. And I could see through this entity. And I could see that I was uh, in the shape of a human, but I was made of... Uh, light, um, but not photons, a different thing than that, metaphorically. And mm -hmm. I could see down the tunnel to the little boy who I knew wasn't me. This bubble that I was inside of then 
opened and I was pulled out into the uh, into this void where I maintained my shape, but had this experience of uh, knowledge and power and ancient wisdom uh, and uh, compassion. And then I was brought back in and the darkness poured inside the space and took on a thousand different shapes as i watched it was like metamorphosizing like a like a gel like a jelly the hot jelly that's moving and moving in all these different shapes and colors and there was a barrier between me and it and it was speaking to me without language and it said to me uh, you you made a deal with me before you were born you you work for me that's but it wasn't in language and i in the in the pronunciation of that i understood that that was true Oh, yes, that's true. That's right. Now I remember. And out I went, back down to the little boy, and uh, inside the same sphere, this energy sphere, and back in the boy, and I went in the house, and I told my mother that God and an angel came and talked to me, and that I work for God, and uh, she didn't understand what I was saying. And so then when I was six, a year later, I had a dog, mm -hmm. a puppy, was mine, and given to me on my birthday. And my dad, one Saturday morning, accidentally ran it over in the driveway and killed it. And I saw this, I saw the immediate aftermath because I was in my bedroom and I heard the the the, the yelp of my dog and I looked out the window and the, then I watched my dad collect the dog. He didn't do it on purpose, um, but uh, it was a shattering experience for me. I bet it would be. Sure was. And so that night, as I was falling asleep, I started to hear my name called. So I went to bed, I, I should say, I went to bed with tears. I, a lot of my dad feels so guilty and he feels terrible and the whole house is in an uproar and I'm crying all day long. And my mom comforts me and I go to, I go to sleep crying. And in the middle of the night, I hear my name being called. And as I hear my name being called, I recognize the voice. And so I sit up in my bed. And as I sit up in my bed, I look behind me and there's the boy asleep in bed, and here I am sitting up, and I have this this translucency to myself. And the room, which uh, was dark, had was illuminated from inside every object. There was this like sepia tone that that illuminated everything. So the radiator and the the, the paneling on the wall all had the similar tone, uh, so I could see. And the voice kept calling me, Peter, 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 come to me, come to me. And so I, but I recognized this voice. So I stood up and when I looked down at my feet, my feet weren't on the floor. I was above the floor. And, and I decided to move toward the voice who I knew loved me. And I, I floated toward the door, but the door was, it had a little crack, open a crack because I was afraid of the dark as a kid, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I put my hand through the knob. Uh, literally, I, I like grabbed the knob, but my hand went right through it. And the voice said, oh, you can't, you, you, material objects walk right through. So I walked right through and I went to the top of the stairs. And at the landing on the stairs, there was this baby elephant. And this baby elephant was dressed all in Indian garb, like sparkly mirrors and colorful Indian elephant clothes. And I floated down the stairs because it was looking at me with, and its eyes were, were sort of almond shaped. And they were as dark as the dark velvet. They were like this blackness, but there was all this compassion emanating from this and love. And, and, and I recognized the voice and it waves waved me down with its trunk and I floated down the stairs and the elephant was my height. So I get down to the stairs and I look into its eyes. And as I look into one eye, I flew inside this eye and I'm back in the same place. I'm back in this, this, uh, massive, immense, uh, infinite, velvety darkness. And I'm, I experienced all wisdom and ancientness and compassion and understanding. And then I got ejected and I'm back outside having had this experience in the, in my head. Um, the elephant says to me, now go outside. And I'm like, I can't go outside. My parents are going to kill me because, you know, you don't go out of the house in the middle of the night. And it's mm. no, 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 it's okay. Go outside. So it, it motioned down the stairs with its trunk and I floated down the stairs and I passed through the front door and the screen door and out into the walkway and down into the street. And I lived on a cul-de-sac. And so I, I looked up at the stars. I says, look up at the stars. It came with, it was still on the stairs, but it came with me inside of me. 
and it says, look up at the stars. And so I looked up at the stars and I could see it was a dark night. There was no moon, lots of stars. And as I looked, I was suddenly transported into them. Like I became, I came like a, like a immediately in the middle of space. And it wasn't just space. It was the immensity of the infinite. And, and when I had this experience of the immensity of the infinite, I became frightened. And in the instant of my, my being frightened, I was back in my body again. And I, I kept these to myself because in the first incident, I told my mom and it got me in trouble because I wasn't mm. supposed to be in the house because the baby was sleeping and didn't, I wasn't in trouble in relationship to what happened to me. I was in trouble because I came in the house, but it, I, you know, my little kid did, I put it all together as one thing. So then when I was in high school, I took a triple hit of LSD and which is, uh, I, I, I didn't mean, I meant to do that. Okay. I did it on purpose, <laughs> but I had no idea what that meant because I'd never done LSD before. And I was in schools at this Catholic school and I was in school when I did this and, um, you know, jackets and ties buttoned down, don't hair, doesn't cut, touch the collar kind of thing. Yeah. I know this and, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in, um, a grammar school so and we had strict rules on all the uh, uniform right. and stuff so i know that i know how that goes <laughs> yeah it's a great equalizer but um so i had this experience um later in the day where i was in the woods and the uh, i was uh on a, on a ski hill i was actually i was working on the ski hill so why i was anyway so i'm working on the ski hill and i'm in the woods by myself and um it's uh, getting dark out because the sun's going down and the whole hillside became this in motion and all the trees started moving. And I was over there by myself because I was tripping my brains out and I didn't know what to do. And so I was trying to hide and, uh, and, and the, the, the tree, the, the trail became this waving form it, and everything was moving. And as the wave came and hit me, Everything around me, the sky, the, the setting sun, the rocks and the stone wall and the snowflakes and everything and me, all of my cells, every part of me was speaking in a unified voice, but it was a, a thousand voices all saying the same thing. I am, I am, I am, I am all of this. I am everything that you see. So I had this, this wildly uh, expansive experience of the of the unity of the physical world and the and that which is beyond it as well so after that happened because i was at this catholic school and we finished reading the gospel of john that year because that was what we we're doing mm -hmm. um my religion teacher went to this retreat in a monastery nearby where they had been practicing what is now called centering prayer which then was called contemplative meditation, which came out of Theravada Buddhism because we had a major Buddhist center in, our, in my state, not far away. And this Catholic tradition of mysticism, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart, and uh, Cloud of Unknowing. And the monks had developed this very Zen style, repetitive practice of breath and chanting, which my religion teacher learned. And because I was so transformed by this LSD trip, um, they actually, my, my classmates started nicknaming me Peace Panagore. Hey, there's Peace. And they were, and it wasn't nice. Okay. They weren't being kind when they were saying it. Um, and, uh, but we, the first week I meditated, I took right to it and I had this moment of silence. And when, in, when I was in this moment of silence, I found access to that same place. And so I began my, my lifelong practice of centering meditation back before my NDE. The last one that I had, uh, well, actually, there's three more. You got time for three more? Let's do three it. Ones? All yeah, right. Go so, for it. <laughs> so, so a, a little while later, um, I had this girlfriend. Oh, man, she was gorgeous. And, uh, and we were on a beach on a retreat, a Catholic, like a Catholic retreat for uh, college students, high school students, uh, and, a, and a camp on a remote lake with maybe 50 people there. This is a big, okay. it was a big group. All right. And, um, she, she lost her necklace on the beach and we're all trying to find it. And I hooked it with my toe by accident. And like, and I found her necklace and, and we're all standing in a circle. And as we, as we stand in a circle, um, after thing, you know, we're like Catholic kids trying to thank God for this, um, this, this wave of energy came up through my feet 
and like like numbing sweet honey slow and warm filled me from the bottom up and and out my arms through my chest and and came around me and and kind of closed here and when it went like that i had this uh, elation feeling my my knees went weak uh, i i i had this presence inside of me where myself was no longer there i was this sweetness itself and then that sweetness dissipated um and they might and the people around me like are feeling my weight and they kind of lay me down in the sand and this energy goes away from me and uh, i don't tell them what happened um because i don't you know i don't want to tell people these things because i don't want people to think i'm crazy mm. so the year before i died I was backpacking on the Appalachian Trail in the Eastern United States. It runs from Georgia to Maine. And I had, I was in Massachusetts, the state I was from, hiking the, the whole length of Massachusetts for spring break. And it was winter. And there was six or eight inches of snow on the ground at the time, March. And I, we were staying in a half cabin that night. And, and as I fell asleep in this half cabin, I, and the guy I was with, he's still my friend of me. He's an atheist. Okay. He's, he's an atheist and he's, he was, a, and he's been a friend of mine ever since we're still buddies, uh, lives in Italy. He's a great guy. I love this guy. Anyway. So he's next to me, Bob, and I'm in my sleeping bag. And as I fall asleep, this same energy, the same angelic being, and it's not like wings and, and, you know, and it's not like that at all. It's just this, this, this like orb of intelligence comes rushing at me and and takes me out of myself. And at, I'm traveling up that same route as I traveled before. And I can see me leaving. It's very rapid. I can see me leaving. I can see the, the half cabin and the, and the trees. And then I can see like the rim of the world and I'm out through the atmosphere again. And on the other side of the atmosphere, I, I'm back in this same darkness. And I'm inside this containment, like a, it's like a room, big round room and it's transparent. And, and when I'm in it, I, 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 I can see my physical form and the voice, this whole darkness is one single voice. And it says to me, raise your hands, not in language, but my hands, I don't like, like, oh yeah, I should raise my hands up because you said so. My hands went up like, because they were roboticized and someone was at the controls. And so my hands go up and, and it says, cup your hands. So my hands are in this cup form and they come up and, and then outside of my bubble, uh, these two hands appear, very gigantic hands, and they have this glass vial filled with what I can see and understand is gold dust, a little black cap like you get for science experiment that you put yeah, things okay. in. And uh, it, it pierces into the bubble, the cap comes off, and then it pours this into my hands to this huge pile of gold dust. And it says to me, I give you this gift, now give it away. And this breath comes and blows it all away. And I'm sent back down and I'm back in my body. And then I, I'm like, what the heck was that? And, and Bob's asleep, he's snoring or something. And I, and I fall back asleep again, second time it happens. I get pulled out, same thing. I'm up that, what they call the silver cord, but it, you know, I, it's not a cord and it's not silver. It's some kind of beamy thing. And I'm inside this entity again and only this time i have this translucency to my body suddenly from below me and above me and inside of me this column of fire erupts and it and it and it can it surrounds me and it's in me and and i'm immediately frightened that i'm going to be burned because this is like fire and as this fire column engulfs me it's the voice says to me you won't be consumed and then I'm out. And I like and, and afterwards, so we're hiking on the trail. We had two or three more days on the trail. And I just shut up. And Pop's like, why aren't you talking? I'm like, nothing to say. I don't know what happened to me. I didn't understand it. And then a year later, one year later, March 1980, this the hike was 79, March 1980, I died ice climbing. And I, I died because I made a mistake. Uh, my mistake was in my gear and my my choice uh, made our climb twice as long as everybody else that day, which meant that by the time we reached the top of the climb, the sun was setting and we didn't, it wasn't an overnight climb. It was a day climb and it was, it was in Alberta, Canada, in the Rocky Mountains of Canada, March, 
uh, you know, day and a half drive from the Arctic Circle kind of thing. Will deep wilderness, but on the Icefields Parkway, a super uh, well-known, world-renowned ice climb. And it was my first day ice climbing. I'd been we had we had just finished a uh, like an eight day snow caving expedition into British Columbia, which is like on the other side of the highway, and but I'd been I'd been rock climbing and mountaineering you know since I was twelve, so but ice was a new ice climbing was a new thing for me, and so I talked my partner into letting me use an axe and a hammer instead of two axes, and the hammer is significantly shorter, which slowed my climb and made me exhausted. So by the time we reached the top of the climb, um, we already knew that we were in a grave situation in the middle of the middle of the wilderness, and all the other teams had left. The sun went down, temperature dropped about thirty degrees, and we didn't have any food. We didn't have any sleeping bags. No, none of the other teams were prepared for overnight either because it's a day climb, and you're and, and the parking mm. lot's right across the street, and it's like I could see the car, um, and. Well, long story short, to get to the NDE, it was a three rappel descent. And okay. it was, uh, as the night went on, the temperature further dropped. We were, I was a skinny fit 20 year old, 21 year old, whatever it was, uh, but no body fat, which meant that I hate my body at one point that night began to consume itself because the only thing keeping me alive, we, we knew we were going to die. Let me back, back, backstage here. Uh, talk, uh, go to the back in the story a little bit. Um, we talked about snuggling up against the face in order to survive like you're supposed to, snuggle together, conserve your warmth. To keep warm, yeah. yeah. Um, but we weren't warm. And so we knew that by doing that, we were definitely going to die. And, and, and I'm, I say, oh, we were going to definitely die. It's the, I was terrified. I was terrified, 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 but I was using my mind. Climbing is a hyper-focused tech, hyper -focused sport. I'm into hyper-focused sports. I, I have been since and before and now and uh, ADD. And so anything where I can get into a zone, I'm in that zone. Sure. Um, that, there's an advantage to that because I could hyper-focus my mind on staying alive and keeping my fear in a little tiny box where it was growing and pulsing and red hot with, with anxiety, but panic will kill you. And Tim, Tim was very similar, my climbing partner, who had his uh, certification as a lead climber, by the way. Um, and so we decided we were going to die. And, and I was on the ski patrol. That's what I was doing at that hill that day. So I'm on a ski patrol in another mountain uh, at this point. And so I'm the first aid guy. I know about hypothermia and frostbite, and I know that we're in deep trouble. And that we were going to die. We were going to die if we stayed still. We maybe might not die if we can get off the mountain in time before the cold kills us. So we made these, uh, we made two traverses and two descents as the hypothermia and frostbite set in deeper and deeper. I still have all my digits, but I was blistered. My feet were frozen like blocks. I still have, I still have residual physical problems from the cold. And it, what temperature was it at that, that point? I don't know, but it was, I don't know because I don't have a way to measure it, but it was, uh, everything was frozen and it kept getting colder and colder. It's, it's, it. British Columbia and Alberta and Canada is it's really, really cold there in the winter. It's really like 50 below skiing in the coldest days, 50 below Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Um, yeah, I was going to say it might be 30 Celsius. Either way, it's still cold. It's freaking <laughs> yeah. cold. And uh, so it, it, it was so cold. I didn't have a way to measure it, but it was so cold that I could feel the cold on the back of my eyeballs. I've never felt the back of my eyeballs before, but as my eyeballs became frozen, like th the, the liquid inside them became thick. And as that was happening, I could feel the cold inside my head um, and penetrating. And it was so, it was so cold that if you ever, have you ever swum in a mountain river or, or, or the cold ocean? I'm not a swimmer, so I haven't experienced uh, you, you that, have. but I, I can imagine. <laughs> well, what happens is, is if it's really cold, your muscles start to cramp up. They stop working. They, get, they just stop working. And so all of my muscles were just stopping working. And, and, I, and meanwhile, we still had to move forward because moving forward is what was keeping us warm. Sure. And moving forward was consuming our energy. And so we're up against this time, cold, energy edge 
with death is always coming at us. And plus we had to be super careful because we're on a freaking cliff and it's 500 feet down and it's vertical. And so, and it's dark and we're roped and we're scared and we're frozen and our brains are being compromised because hypothermia steals reason. It makes you make mistakes and it makes a person confused and it confuses coordination. So all these, all these pressures are on us. And so finally we make it down to this last rappel. We fight all the way across through the mountain, through the night. We get to this last rappel and in this place, there are, there's safety installed. It's the top of the practice climb where they have carabiners and, and pins in the mountain so that you can easily repel up and down this rock face. And, and this rock face has a, has a ledge on it. It's like a big boardroom table size of thing with these two safeties. So Tim was to my left on safety with a carabiner clipping to his harness. And I was to the right and I had the rope and it was sometime early morning. I, I, I don't know, mid, like when I mean mid, I mean like 3 a.m. kind of thing or 4 a.m. I don't really know what time it was. Cause I didn't have to watch and, and I wasn't, and I really didn't care. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so all I cared about was this right where I was trying to survive. And so I took the rope and I tied it to my harness and I tossed it out around the corner. Cause there was this cr- corner that we had just come down this, come down this way and then traversed on this little bit of a ledge, but there was this corner here and I tossed it out around. And as I pulled on the rope somewhere up above us, there was a, a couple of rocks and the rope lay inside these rocks. And, and as soon as I pulled, it wedged. And then I pulled again and it wedged tighter. And then I pulled again and it wedged like immovable. Yeah. And, and no slack. So uh, now we're, we're in this place. We're in the middle of nowhere by ourselves. And we can't go up and we can't go down. Either way is death. So I kept pulling on the rope. And of course, all it did was make it tighter and tighter. I tried to flick the rope to get it out. And. But, but I couldn't get the, the flick around the corner. You know, you, it, as soon as it, you flick a rope or a hose and when it touches an object, the waveform stops. And so the waveform stopped at the edge. I couldn't get it free. So cold is coming. Uh, now we're not moving. So we're not using up our energy to, to provide warmth for ourselves because there's nowhere to go. We can't do anything. Um, I got colder and colder and colder. And then I had this moment of getting hot where I all of my... I felt like all my blood rushed to my core and I unzipped my coat because I was hot, which was irrational, which created uh, an escape for the heat. And so the cold came faster. And and then I had this moment of recognition and understanding that I was going to die there and that there was nothing I could do about it. And I started thinking about my parents. My sister had vanished when I was 14. She'd run away and that caused lots of damage in my family. Uh, emotional damage, social damage, uh, psychological damage, uh, especially to my mom and my dad, but to me as well. That's why I was out West in the first place. I was, I was like not going back home intentionally. Mm. I'm staying away for as long as I can. Um, And, but it was going to, I could see that it was going to kill my parents because they're going to lose two kids. And, and then I was really going to die. She wasn't dead. They didn't know where she was or what had happened to it. This open wound of um, estrangement. Um, but I was really going to die. And and then I started thinking about God. But I wasn't thinking about the Catholic God or the Orthodox God. I was thinking about this divine entity, this being that I had met. And I had this sense of peace descend on me. when I When I accepted my situation, instead of being frightened, all of my fear went away. And this wave of peace just swept through me of acceptance and surrender. And then I would, I began to fall asleep and smack my head a helmet on, smack my head on the rock and my shoulder and wake back up and stand back up again, pull on the rope and to no avail, of course, because the rope didn't move. Um, And then I stood back up this last time and there was this big black circle around my vision, which closed really rapidly. And as it closed, I thought to myself, I must be falling asleep again. But this time when it closed, I didn't fall asleep. I awoke and I I awoke and the mountain was gone. All of my pain was gone. My physical, I wasn't, I, I was attached to my physical form, but I was outside of it. I was like in front of my body and, 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 and everything that I could see became this immense darkness and this immense darkness was in front of me. And I wondered 
what the heck is going on? I don't understand what's going on here. And because I was alone, every other time I'd been out of my body, you know, I'd been accompanied somehow, but this time by myself. And I'm like, what is this? And way, way, way far in the distance, it's like the size of the universe. It's like, it's like being out on the, on the darkest night of all. And then the clouds part and you can see one single star and you know, this star is, you know, like not really a star, it's a galaxy and it's 500 billion light years away. And I, I had the sense that this was, incredibly distant from me and and in this darkness but as soon as it was illuminated i could see in the darkness and then it rushed toward me across this vast space and as it came toward me it filled my vision with itself and communicated to me telepathically no language uh, you're coming with me and i wasn't afraid i i understood this was the light but i wasn't going to go anywhere i was like i'm not going anywhere I'm staying right here because it's still, you know, my folks, my family, I'm staying right where I am. And so I put up my willpower to stop this. I'm not going anywhere. And it just reached and scooped me like a, like an ice cream scoop and soft ice cream. And I'm out and, uh, and, and plop me in a bowl and the bowl I'm inside of this, this, uh, this energy form, this, uh, this big ball again. But this time for the first time I am severed. From my body. Every other time I've been out of my body, I've been attached to it. But this time there was like this distinct severing, like snip, like an umbilical cord. And I'm, I'm have a body of light shaped human, but not a thing. I'm not, a, I'm not a photon. I'm something other than that, but I have this human shape ish and I'm inside this entity traveling back up the route that it had come down and I can see myself. I can see like I have eyes to see myself and I can see myself because I have this other location. I am outside of myself. I'm super positioned outside of myself, like a God's eye seeing this entity and me in it. And I can see it inside myself. So I can see, I can see that I'm here. And I can see through the transparency and I've got this other point of view at the same time. It wasn't flipping from like channel to channel or even like side by side screens. It was the same image. Just dual and, vision in a way. Yeah, exactly. And I'm swept up inside this thing and it's super positioned. So somehow I know that it is the fullness of the divine itself because I because it's feeding me comfort. It's feeding me. It's showing me its intellect. It's it's vast smarts, way far beyond uh, anything I understand. But and 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 comfort. It's feeding me comfort. Uh, but I also know that in and of itself, it's somehow a reduction of this fullness that I sense is is itself. Sort of like the the mouth, the bell of a trumpet, and the mouthpiece. Um, the mouthpiece is, is like way far away, but the sound's coming out where I am. And um, I get swept up to the edge of this place where the space between where I saw the light appear. And then it opened and I popped into another space. And I, I'm going to take a break here and see if you want to jump in. Oh, definitely, because you've hit us with a lot of info. There. There's a lot to unpack. So let's go right back. I know this is going to jump all the way back to the beginning, but we'll totally follow cool. the questions right through from there to now, um, to the end of what you've just said. So you're five years old. You're in the tree. This thing takes you up, whatever that thing was to you at that stage. It takes you out. Is it what we would class as a true out-of-body experience? Oh, and yeah. did you control it or were you pulled, like you mentioned? I was not in control at all. I was being, I was being done to. I had no agency. I had no, I, I had understanding and I had, I had will in so far as I could uh, acquiesce to the understanding that I had this job to do, but I hadn't, I wasn't making any of this happen. This is completely done to me and I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. So you had knowledge uh, that you were there for a task, but at that stage, presumably, because you're five, you don't know what task it was. I, I did sort of, but not like a task, like a thing. The task was to be a voice, 
to be uh, to embody to uh, work. So there's this book called Illusions: Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, and some of your uh, listeners might know Jonathan Livingston Seagull. That book from a long time ago, but the I author don't personally also, know it, but they might do. Yeah, they yeah. might. Anyway, so in in illusions, the author's a near death experiencer. Um, in in illusions, the the lead character says um, he wanted to be the Messiah, but he quit. He was sent to be the Messiah, but he quit. He's like, I don't want this job. He became a, a flying and he became a pilot instead in the story. And mm-hmm. what I took away from that, and what I understood, um, is that. There's no specific job that I have. There's no task I have to complete. It's not like I'm. I could. I could have been a an architect, a glass blower, uh, a, a bricklayer. It doesn't really matter. What the task is not the action. The task is the being. It's the actual. It's the. It's the. It's the stripping away of self in order to be present to the divine. And that is, that's what I understood when I was a kid. That's what I've come to understand all through all of my mystical experiences, all of them. Uh, they all have to not do with the, the action is the result of the being, not the other way around. Um, so, so the being part, you're just being you, is, is the task, well, I know I shouldn't use that word, but is that just, is it the you getting the message out or is it just you being you? It's, and it's not being me being Peter. Peter is not what I'm talking about here. The, and all of my experiences, if you've had an out-of-body experience of any kind, uh, even at the scene of a car wreck uh, and you pop out of your body and you pop back in or in some other kind of traumatic experience, uh, it may confuse you how you could have, how you could see your body lying on the sidewalk, but you know now that your consciousness isn't your body. I've known from early childhood that my consciousness, myself, who I actually am, isn't this physical form. My my task in this physical form isn't to be the best Peter I can be. The task in in this physical form is to uh, become non-attached to the story that I tell myself about who I am. I allow the energy itself to be me because that's who I am. I am not, I am this other thing. I inhabit this body, and and I exp- my NDE left me with this distinct moment to moment ongoing experience of inhabiting this form and being above it simultaneously. I'm I, from the day that I came back, I live I I live this thing where it's not so much that I've got to you know finish cleaning the bathroom today by five o'clock. That's my task for the day, um, but I have to. Uh, be present to my higher self while I'm doing it. And that my task isn't to have an accomplishment. My task is to be. And the, But, okay, that said, that said, I've spent my entire life trying to prepare to become a communicator for this. And uh, I went to graduate school for it. I worked in my career in communication storytelling and literature and writing and uh, public speaking in order to talk about it. But I also know that everything I say about it is not the thing itself. I can't say what it is. I can't ever say what it is. But I have, I've practiced um, my Kriya Yoga and my, my centering prayer over my lifetime uh, to silence myself to maybe be able to get out of the way enough so that as I speak, it might weave itself into the, the, the vibration and the sound of my voice the 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 breath as I breathe it so that people can have a a taste of the divine itself. That's really what my mission is, is to try to have people have a like what they call a Shakti experience of some kind of an energy transfer experience where I can I can become a little bit of a channel so that they can feel it for themselves. When you feel it for yourself, when a person has this resonance inside them, they don't need me anymore. You now know that this thing is inside of you and this is you. And so that's that's the task I agreed to as a five year old. How how very I'm gonna say strange, and I don't need to put that in a, know, in a negative I, connotation, but it is a strange thought and scenario. Um I know. to what end? To what end is this the mission or whatever to allow other people to feel this experience? What is it for, would you say? Well, so the light can see itself. 
That, that so there's this thing that happens. The reason why it resonates is because the divine is in everything there is. But in human beings, we have this capacity for communication with it. You, you it doesn't have to just be humans. You can have it with your dog. It can happen with the tree outside. You feel this resonance with it. But but when my my what I'm trying to help people do, I guess there's a couple of different things that are the results. One would be to recognize that they're transient here and that their attachment to the world and their, 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 the, the action that they take for the, for the self's survival in the world uh, that excludes others uh, is a false idea because everything is connected and everything is one thing. And not only that, you're not even from here. You're passing through here, and if you set your goals so that your your world becomes the end, the means is your action, and the end is the world, uh, then that's what you get. But that's not where you are. And so part of what I'm trying to do is multiple things. One, I'm trying to show that life, when life ends, we don't. And because we don't, to aim toward what we actually are would be beneficial. Why? Because then you get a perspective of understanding of the value of how to live life. And get life better, presumably. Presumably, yes. It doesn't take away the suffering, but what it does is it shifts perspective on what the suffering means. Yeah, and I bet you'll never know the answer truly to that, will you? Not here. Not there, here, that's for what sure. I mean. Yeah. yeah, no, you can't. It's not possible. Okay, so here's another question about the five-year-old experience. You said you had this watery sound that came yeah. sort of through you. Was there a buzzing associated with that? Because I've heard during all the outer bodies, a lot of people say they have a buzzing feeling and then off they pop. Well, kind of like I when I was a kid, I was thinking of trumpets, like a big, huge, like a thousand trumpets. And so, yeah, there was vibration feeling. So yeah. I described it in this case as a waterfall, but the waterfall, if you've ever been next to a waterfall, you just don't hear it. It has a resonance that kind of oh, yeah. vibrates, right? So the same thing, I could have described it because this is all metaphor. It's not the thing itself. I could have described this as a thousand trumpets. And when you're in front of a trumpet, if you have someone put a, a trumpet in front of your chest and blow on that trumpet, you feel it inside. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah, it resonates. There was yeah. this... Yeah, there was this total vibration thing that was happening. Mm. See, I didn't know whether when you started going through that part of the story, whether it was a mechanism for a different type of being from what other people say as part of the out of body. That's why I thought to ask that question. Like, was it a true out of body or was it something slightly different that I've not heard before? I don't know what you've heard before, but I was totally out of my body. And the, yeah. and that this that this channel that I, this elevator shaft that I went up, um, was part of, uh, part was me. Like I was stretched like taffy. And oh, so nice. I was in <laughs> two places at once. So yeah, I love taffy. I was stretched in two <sighs> places at once. Um, and there was a cord between, um, and that, that cord connected me directly to my body. There was no separation from it, but I was, I was never my physical form and I was way outside of it. And when you were up there, you didn't care a jot about Peter, no? No. I, it was, I was very, oh, he'll be fine. I don't really, yeah, didn't really care. No. Whatever, yeah. Because a lot of people I've spoken to on the NDE say they just, they have no emotional connection whatsoever. No, because you're you're not that thing. That's yeah, like exactly. looking at a rock. Costume, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's very strange. Okay, let's move ahead to your... I'll, we'll call it LSD uh, scenarios. It's an interesting one, this one, because there is that uh, supposed link or there could be an actual link with DMT and other hallucinogens oh, yes. right to the other realms, right? Correct. Is it also possible that LSD also ha doesn't have that effect where in some people where you could just have a trip and then you do see weird things through the brain? Where Where would you say it sits in the connection to another realm or just a random I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I've, I, I took plenty of acid after that in order to re, 
uh, have the experience, and I never, but I never took the same dose. So uh, John Hopkins University in the United States has been doing this ongoing study called the Transcendent Study in its psychedelic studies, mm -hmm. uh, using psilocybin in particular. And uh, I found out about this study because a, a guy contacted me, a, a person near where I live who knew I was an NDE, because he was in the study. So he got, he was in the study, never had a mystical experience. Um, high dose, high dosages of LSD, of uh, psilocybin, of DMT can give a person an end of duality experience. That's what the study is showing. Mm -hmm. It's it's and this is rigorous science. This is not you know, but, but what happened in the seventies, and I was kind of the tail end of that. A whole lot of people were, were uh, turning in, uh, tuning in, turning on, and dropping out. And I lived near Harvard. And I, I lived not far from Harvard University, where all this was, you know, the epicenter of Timothy Leary. So it was kind of in the culture where I lived. And um, the whole generation of people had these end of duality experiences. So uh, I never took a triple hit again. It's in the dosage. What drove you? What drove you to take the LSD? Was it just because it was culture at that stage or were you searching for something? No, neither of those things. I was trying to not commit suicide. Um, I had been, I had become suicidal because of my, I had a, I had a, my sister's vanishing by, this is four years later, I had caused such turmoil in my family that I had a, I had a bleeding ulcer um, that I was getting medical treatment for. And uh, I was, we were, I love my parents very much. Um, my, my dad has passed on. My mom is not well now and there she's in her nineties, but at the time, um, we were restricted. We weren't allowed to ever talk about my sister to each other or in the house or to anyone else. So we were all, uh, and there were, there were social political reasons for that in my family. Um, and so I was, I was sick. I was sick and, and in despair. And about a week before I did this, I, I had this like 1969, 10 year old car uh, that I pulled into the garage and I tried to asphyxiate myself with it. I put a hose to it and into the car because I just wanted out. And, uh, mm. but you know, I couldn't close the garage door over the trunk. And so I couldn't actually make a containment unit that I could, you know, be confident that I wouldn't survive. So I decided to, if I couldn't kill myself, I would at least leave. And so I took, a, I bought this hit of acid off this kid. And, and after 45 minutes in, in class, um, nothing happened. And so I, I, I met him in the, like, the bathroom and I was like, Hey man, give me two more hits. No, give me another <laughs> hit. Give me another hit, man. He's like, no, he hasn't even hit you. Know, you don't know. And I'm like, just do it. And um, I was pretty adamant and I was uh, pretty strong. I was, I was rowing crew at the time. So it's kind of a beefy kid and um, a little bit of, he was bigger than me, but a little bit of the little boy threat. Um, <laughs> and he opened, he, he opened the bag and I grabbed one. And as I grabbed one, I grabbed two. And, and um, I took him before he could say anything. He's like, you took two. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> no, don't worry about it. We speak French here. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. All right. I've been trying to keep my language clean. Anyway, so uh, he, uh, I paid him, of course. And then I had this. So I was, I was intentionally, my goal wasn't anything other than not being me. Sure. Okay. So I, I understand that that ma makes perfect sense. Um, when you have the next scenarios where you're slightly older again, is that, do you think, a flashback from the LSD itself? Or is it, again, a separate experience that you would say is, again, that thing pulling you? Yes, separate experience. I had flashbacks from um, LSD, uh, so I know what they are. I was, in an, I was in an astronomy class one day after tripping the day before, and I was... Uh, trying to pay attention. And then I had this, this intensive flashback that came and then it went away. And um, I think that might've been one of the last times I took it. Cause I was like, I couldn't, I can't deal with that when I'm trying to go mm. to school. Um, I think I took it one more time after that. Um, but yeah, no, not, not flashback at all. This is the, 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 the difference of reality is so pronounced that there's no mistaking what it is. There's no questioning, is this real or is this not real? This is real. This, this other realm, um, for lack of a term, is uh, it's more real than this. It's far more real than this. Yeah, I hear that a lot. I think that's very intriguing. Now, you know it because you felt it, you've been there, you've seen it all 
you know, all the sensory input you've had. For me and other people who haven't had the experiences, they can't fathom it. Nope. It's a, and I've said this to somebody else before. It's just, it's the knowing that is the bit that we all want to get to. Because I want to know what you've seen, heard and felt, maybe without going through the death experience. Do you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. And that's the problem. It's like, I describe it as being a parent. So I, I didn't know I'm a parent and I, I had no idea what that meant until I had a baby. And, and, and suddenly I've, I'm thrust into this world where, where what I thought from the outside was what it was to be a parent was nothing at all what it was like to be on the inside. Uh, and mm. so the transition was shocking and sudden um, and total. And what I thought I knew turned out not to be true at all. And so the problem with this is that unless it's, it's super subjective, uh, and it's individualized. It's subjective and individualized. So you can only have it yourself and that everybody's experience has a little variation to it. And the, th the thing about it is, though, it's not new. It's all through the literature, through the history of the world. It's in the Upanishads, it's in the Vedas, the Tao Te Ching. It's all over the place because it's the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It's, all, it's everywhere um, because it's real. And the only way to understand it is to experience it. And people do, though. And small doses too. So you have an, an after death visitation. Somebody comes to visit you. Your 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 God forbid uh, your mom dies, and then a week later she shows up in your dream. And and it's not just a dream. It's it changes your grief. It changes your grief because you know that she's real. You have this this transient experience um, that that well it changes the course of your grief. Now you know that she's not dead, and you can't convince anybody of that but you are yeah it's uh, i've had that before right years ago my nan died years and years and years ago um and in my one of my dreams she came to me and she was around and i kept saying but nan you're dead how are you here you know is that thing and then I, I felt that sort of like sadness right to my core that i've never felt before you know that heavy emotional outpouring so I understand it to a degree, um, but I've never fathomed your level because I've never experienced it. But I can under I can get it logically in my head. Um, if you hadn't have taken that LSD scenario, do you think you'd still be on the same path for your NDE or not? So let's just take the LSD experiences mm. out completely. Would you have still been there? I don't know. You, was you it a part this, of it? You could ask. Oh, it wouldn't be a. You could ask the same question if I didn't, if I, if I, any question, if, if I made any other choice in my life, I made the choices that I made and all of those looking back over my shoulder are part of my life experience, but also the mystical experiences all kind of stack up with each other. It, 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 so if my sister hadn't run away, I wouldn't have taken the LSD. And if so, choices that she made set me up to make my choices. She didn't make my choices for me. Mm. So I, I, I don't think that the, I don't think the path is as linear as people might think it is. Uh, would I have ended up with an NDE? Uh, uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> years and years and years later, I was uh, working, I lived and worked on this island off the coast of where I live. And it's a, it's a, has about 3000 people on it. And it's about the size of Manhattan, Manhattan Island. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a lobstering community and a, a lobstering and arts community. And I lived there and there was a, a palm reader there. And I'm not, I'm not one for palm reading very much, but she's, I liked her. And she's like, let me read your palm. And I'm like, sure. Read my palm. And she looks at my palm and she says, what the hell you have two lifelines and a break in the middle. Like, like, not just one break, but like two. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. I say, I don't know what you're talking about. But you uh, did know. Because <laughs> I was not going to say a word. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what that means. I, I don't ask. I stopped asking questions like what if, because what if and why? Because I can't know. I can't know. But it's fascinating to theorize on though, isn't it? Well, I love and I love analysis. I, I do love analysis. I love looking at things and and trying to see uh, from other points of view because I think that that's what keeps my mind flexible.
Yeah, it's good. I always wonder if fate is a solid thing that you can have myriad yeah. of small choices here uh, and there, but you end up in the same place. Well, see, that's the thing that happened to me at the end of my first near death experience is that uh, I chose to come back. I had, the, I had a, in brief, uh, we can go back over mm -hmm. if you want to, but in brief, sure. I had, uh, uh, I experienced the light. Um, I was in it. It was me. I expanded. I had a life review. I saw myself as a, uh, uh, an individual photon of the of the unit of field of photons. I was the same as and superpositioned. I had a, a a a soul that was below this higher self that was incarnated into all of these other lives, and I experienced um, unity among all sorts of other stuff. But I had this state of of union with with the oneness of being, which has set the course of my life, which is why I'm in pursuit of it now. So. But that I chose to come back, and I chose to come back. And as I came back, I uh, was being compressed inside this same angelic being, this energy orb of consciousness um, that was carrying me back. And as I went, I could see this huge, wide beam, laser beam, white light emanating out of the darkness. I couldn't see back into heaven anymore. It was a, there was a barrier, but out of this darkness, there's this beam. And this beam uh, was a doorway. And around this beam that was this gigantic doorway were a, like, like the lattice behind you. There was a, a thousand, a million different doorways um, surrounding this uh, brilliantly white white light here fading out to the edge and all of them were choices from the life I could live and it said to me choose light choose life and choose a life and so I, I I made this quick calculus and I chose a door and as I went through this doorway down this tunnel inside of this doorway were all these other doors leading to all these other tunnels um, and all of these were probabilities. They were all probabilities. And my, my experience of my life is that um, I weave my way through these tunnels with the choices that I make. I turn left, I turn right, I go up, I go down. Um, my interior orientation toward the light itself leans me in a certain direction. But as I experience it in my, hum my human life, I, I see and know what's going to happen to me just before it happens. It's, I, live, I live sort of dislocated in time. I'm a little ahead of where my body is. And, and I know that every decision that I make, and because everybody's making decisions around me, right? So there are things that I can't control, the weather. You know, it snows. And, you can't and the, control the weather. I know if I- What's you know, going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and other people's decisions I can't control. And yeah. so they impact my choices. Um, and so is fate this linear thing? And and no, it's not. It's it's not. Maybe there's a maybe the uh, maybe out of the million tunnels, there's only a hundred thousand I can travel through. So there's some sort of you know confinement to this. Uh, but there's a seven, eight billion people on the planet all making decisions. We're all impacting everybody else. So I don't know the answer to the question. All I know is the one thing that is reality for me, the one thing that is grounding for me is always leaning toward this light because I know that that's what my reality is. And so in all the choices that I make and all the, the fates and destinies that, uh, that, are, that are possible, um, I let them be as they are. I let them be as they are. I try not to try to second guess. Although, you know, it's like, oh my God, why didn't that thing work out? I have that too. I have that experience. I put all this effort into this thing and the door closes in your face and you get a bloody nose. And, um, and you're like, why didn't I put all this effort in this? And, uh, but the direction of my life, of my interior life, uh, always, even when the blood, I'm wiping up the blood off my lip, um, my orientation is always toward this light. And so my destiny my fate isn't isn't so much tied up in this world. It's tied up in that world. So all the choices you're given now, and so not given, all the choices you're making now, you're always making towards the positive, knowing that it's, you're ending up in a good place. I'm always making toward the positive with a capital P, but that doesn't mean I always make good decisions. No, because that... Who knows? We don't know everything, do we? No. And sometimes my ego gets in the way and I make a poor decision, an, an emotional decision, I would call that.
Mm. Right, I have so, I have four things that came up into my mind when you were talking then. Um, one, w- The first thing I want to address is your choice to come back. How was a choice presented to you? Did they say be- you can stay here or you can go back? Was it that simple? Yeah, it was that simple. I was being invited to stay. Like, uh, come home, come home. This is, I, you know, I, you're my beloved. But what happened was, is that I... After my after this union experience, I somehow shrunk back down and could see uh, my parents again. And uh, I said, "Am I dead?" And the voice said, "Yep, you're dead." And I said, "Well, what about my folks?" And I was swept across this belly of this infinite no thingness uh, into uh, like a field where I could see our universe, and I I could see our planet. But I could see a whole lot of things, but I, I get to this point. I, I could see our planet and I could see light inside of everyone. I could see that not anybody, that the people on earth couldn't see the light inside of everyone. And, and it was inside of everyone. There was a little tiny gold speck um, and I could see in lifetime. It wasn't like the dream. I was watching people alive, living their lives. And inside of them, they had this golden speck of light. And then my parents' faces showed up and and it was like, mom and dad here and mom and dad here, two parallel lives. And the first life was with me in their life. I, I live and I go with them and I could see their suffering. I could, I, I saw their lives and I could see what they were going to go through and I could see their death and their, and their afterlife. And then in the second level, I could see their living without me. And the pain that they were living without me was you know, 10 times worse like shattering destruction, like nuclear weapons going off and sure. not in reality, but in their lives. And, and I could see the end of their life. I could understand that the length of their life was a snap of the fingers, the same as mine. I was in timelessness. And, and I could see that in their end, they'd be like me. They'd be in this bliss, in this paradise, uh, because that's what they were made of because nothing is lost. And, um, and, 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 the voice said, come home, but also was giving me this choice. And I recognized that the length of my life was a wink of an eye. So I thought to myself, can I, to the divine thinking is my being, can I, if I go back, can I come back here? And the voice says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you come back here. And I say, well, I choose to live my life. And the voice says, you won't live your life and throws me out. You won't live your life. You won't live the life that you were going to live. That life is over. Oh, I see. The, you go yeah, back, yeah, you're I a different you person. Yes. Um, which had been one of my questions to you, which is when you come back, have you come back with any new skills or new thought patterns? I know you've mentioned earlier you've had new thought patterns because you're aiming in a slightly different uh, mental state now. But have you come back with any skills? Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, some weird kind of things. Like uh, the next year, I moved in with this guy who I'd known from childhood at, back at my university, and and he would occasionally throw things at me just to. And he would do this when there were visitors in the room, and I would have my back to him. He'd throw pillows and crumpled up paper balls and stuff, Good and lad. to show that I would never <laughs> get hit. I could never be hit. I could always catch it. I could always knock it out of the way. I could always duck. I I could always, I would, I had this, like, I, I could just like, like in the, in the, some movie, I, I could, you know, and uh, you weren't I doing was, this catching balls behind you I and was, stuff. <laughs> I was, I was catching balls and, and, and ducking out of the way of stuff. And I came back with a higher level. I was always pretty athletic, but I, 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 I came back with a higher level of, uh, of, of athleticism. I it was better than I was before. And, um, which is kind of a weird thing, uh, but there you go. It I is a weird come, thing. So you've come back with is. greater awareness and athleticism. Yeah. For what reason? I have no idea. Maybe a better ultimate Frisbee player, <laughs> uh, maybe better, <laughs> yeah. better skier, you know, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I think, I think this is what was going on I, when I was dead. My seeing, thinking, feeling, understanding, hearing self was one thing. I wasn't, there weren't components to me. I was a singular entity. My thinking was my moving, my, mo- my locomotion. My, my thinking was my asking. 
show me, I, I thought about the structure of the universe and I was shown like all the chemistry and all the biology and, and, and physics and uh, all in one big glop. And how and quickly? It, uh, like that. And, um, and that was when I was dead. And so w- when I came back, there was this singular nature to me. I came back, I have, my seeing is my feeling, is my smelling, is my sensing. I have like this, uh, I have this hyper sense. It's my, call it, call it my prana or my chi or my, my Holy Spirit or my divine energy, whatever name, I am this singular entity inhabiting this thing. And, and as such, my, I feel the light as much as I see the light. Um, and so o- over the years, and I, and I'm going to, pre- I should say that when I was a kid, I played little league baseball and I was, I was the, usually the worst kid on the team. I, I was a pretty good athlete, like skier, but I could never catch a ball and I couldn't hit one. Uh, by the time I was um, now in my thirties or maybe forties, I was playing in a, in a, in a Sunday game, softball game. I was playing second base. I could catch everything. I could catch anything I could. I, and um, that was just until I aged out. Now I've totally aged out. And I can't <laughs> catch anything anymore. It's cool you can that. always play vets league. That's what I do with football. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a little older, but yeah, that's what I was. I was, I know that I'd be welcome at the game because we had 80 year olds playing when I was there. Um, but you know, if I can't play second base, I don't want to play outfield. <laughs> no, no I don't blame you. <laughs> um, here's the thing that struck me while you were saying that again. Do you think physical skills are a slightly different kettle of fish? Or I'm going to just park that aside a sec. But mental skills, do you think when you come back, because you're, in a way, you're forcing your ego out of the way because you've learned that isn't the big thing, the skills were always there, but the ego was suppressing them, do you think? And because you've pushed it out of the way, your hyper-awareness is now coming to the fore. Do you think that's what it is? Or is that hyper-awareness coming back into you to add it's an addition. It's, it's it's an addition. both. Okay. It's not well. It's it's an addition to me. Like my experience of it as a human being is an addition, but it's always been me. So it's not an addition um, to my higher self. It's always been what it is. And, and so this physical thing that I have is an aspect of my perception. You mentioned thought patterns. This mm. is an aspect of my thought patterns. I I fe- this is another sense I have. And so my brain has this. I feel this. I feel it. It's a physical thing for me. Um, and my, my perception of the world so radically changed that I, I, could, I could see and can see the world is like this black and white film projection uh, that's frail and flimsy and flickering. Um, but it, the film itself, the existence of the film itself is a projection of the light behind it. It's not like this film and then there's light f- shining through it that makes it appear. It's that they are the same thing. And the light, there's still this light projection into it. And that that perception, which includes my continual unavoidable knowledge that I live inside of this thing, makes me a very different human being in relationship to everybody else. So my thought patterns are a result of my, of my experience as it is for everybody. Um, but my experience is like alien. Um, and so my desire for my higher self took dominance in my life. So much so that I changed the course of my life. I was going to be an architect in my family firm and was going to go to graduate school in architecture. I even got accepted. Um, But I went to divinity school. I went to, I studied mysticism at Yale, which is, they don't teach that there, but there was classes around and the Dean allowed me to do this three-year independent study. And I went in pursuit of knowledge uh, in order to understand myself and to see if there were peers, if I had peers in the in the history of the world, and how they dealt with this, so I went on this sort of selfish journey. I, I, I my selfishness was how do I live in the world as this person, knowing that no one sees what I see. How do I 
use my brain in order to cope. And so if there was a shift in my thought patterns, it went from my, my uh, artistic self, this is a, a drawing mm -hmm. pencil from my artistic self uh, to uh, a linguistic self. And I chose, I chose, and I'm, I'm, I'm dyslexic. So I didn't learn to read till I was in seventh grade. Not really. Um, I, I, I was in remedial reading, what they used to call remedial reading, which is now it's a special uh, reading class. Um, but I became uh, a scholar and a writer. And uh, I attribute that to my desire for communication, which came out of my experience. I knew when I came back this first time in my first near death that, I, that my job, as we mentioned before, my task was not just to be, but to be a communicator of it. And, and it was like being thrust back here in exile with a, a, with a jackknife and a flashlight and nothing in and, and a foreign land where you don't know the language and you're on an alien planet and everything is weird. And so now make do kid, figure it out for yourself. Good luck. I'll see you when you come back. Um, Have a nice so, day. Slap on the ass. Right. Yeah, coffee right. pot. Out the door. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Exactly. Here's the thing. Are you a different person now? Are, are, do you have a different personality now than when you went? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> I Because of my little experiences as a kid, um, I had an extra dose of compassion. But because I'm a, so my parents tell me anyway, um, but because I'm an, an, uh, I have attention deficit disorder, I was a troublemaker. I was in trouble a fair amount of times in my life. And there were times I should have been in trouble that just didn't get caught. Um, uh, and yeah, so, so but I was a few never, banks, did you? Yeah. yeah well, not, not quite as bad <laughs> as that, but, um, but uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't an angel and, but I was always a good kid. I always had this extra conscience. I always had a conscience with me. Um, and, but after my NDE, I, my personality did shift. I looked the same and I talked the same, but my, let me put it this way. My morality doesn't grow out of a code of ethics. Uh, that when all of my belief systems vanished when I died, everything, no belief in politics and uh, anything that human beings, religion, anything that human beings construct in their heads out of language. I don't believe in any of that. Um, I use it, I live with it, but it's it's not real. It's not lasting. It doesn't matter, does it? That's the thing, I think. Nope. You park it aside because it doesn't matter really in the grand scheme of things. That's right. Two more things. Um, I want to hit on hierarchy. And I think hopefully you'll, you'll understand where I'm going with this. You said earlier that there was a point of light and then there was the soul underneath. And then there was extra layers. So can you, to the best of your ability, describe this hierarchy, if you will, of the afterlife? What is where? What do we call it? What is it to the best of your knowledge? Well, it's more than what I just described. And in, in a subsequent mystical experience after my NDE, I traveled from through realm to realm, heaven to heaven, and in each heaven experience, in this one out-of-body experience, and in each heaven experience, it felt to me like it was the ultimate until I shed another layer of my light self, of my, and I wasn't in a physical form, and to the next layer, then there was, there was more purity and more purity and more purity. So there was, there's like this in my understanding of of my own experience, there were, I don't know how many layers, many, many layers to reach the infinite light. So to the core of the infinite light. The, this field of photons were all superpositioned with each other. They were all separate. It's like looking up at a starry sky at night and seeing with no moon and uh, the, with the new moon, it's totally black outside and there's a bazillion stars and, and you're far, somewhere far into the wilderness where you can see the stars are huge and they're all these colors and they're pulsing and they're twinkling and, and there's blues and greens. You can see them, especially if you pick up binoculars. And, and uh, the, that was what it was like, except for that they were all superpositioned with each other. They were all individual, but they were all one thing. And I was one thing, one of these photons, but I was outside of the field, the massive field, but I was superpositioned with it. So I was connected to it. But 
also, the light itself is emanating, pouring out of this greater darkness. This greater darkness is this uh, infinity. And when I say infinity, I mean incomprehensibility. I mean, I mean, the the light itself is like a manifestation of the unspoken, unspeakable. You know, the the Hindus they talk about Maya, and the, so people know Maya usually means illusion here. But there's another meaning for the word Maya in conjunction with that, and that is the energy that makes everything exist. It's not just that it's an illusion; it's the divine energy that makes things exist. That light energy that pours out of this darkness is the space of of union it, it it is so yes hierarchy now that i've given that so i had i saw experience and experienced my some of my incarnations I, I i i saw i saw all these lives that i had lived a thousand lives a million lives i don't know there's a lot a lot a lot a lot of lives and and but they weren't really me i was this Low, I, I describe it as a baguette. I'm in mean, this long French baguette uh, <laughs> that, that emanates out of the, the greater darkness that exists for a long period of time before it begins like with kebab spears. So there's all these kebab spears in the baguette and the kebab spears with a little ring on the end of them, you know, you, so you don't burn your fingers. Um, they're all the lives I lived and they were all happening simultaneously and they were me, but none of them were me. And this baguette, was me, but I was this photon. And this photon was connected to this field of photons. And this field of photons itself was was the divine expression of the light itself. And it was emanating out of this greater darkness. So yeah, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and unto infinity. And, and so here's the thing about infinity. You can't really get there because it's infinite. What a hard thing for you to have to describe when people like me ask you questions like that, because it's hard to get these things across, isn't it? Because how can the human mind comprehend two things at once in the same place at once, there's whilst being other things? And it's almost hard to picture in your mind, isn't it? That's Well, that's yeah. why I went to school. So I, 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 well, that's why I did that. And that's why I've been studying, you know, why I, I work in literature and, and write books and read and I read and read and read because um, I want vocabulary. I want structure. I want to be able to. So when I came back, I had this experience and I was living as an alien in this body. I knew I it was inhabiting this body. I knew that I was in a world that was the same as it was when I left, but entirely different because now I could see inside of it and that I couldn't tell anybody about it. And I couldn't even tell myself about it because I didn't have any language for it. My language was rudimentary Catholic. And so, you know, and, and that comes with all this baggage for meaning. So I went in exploration for, uh, to find language that I could reconceptualize so that I could understand and have a way to reflect what happened to me. And so I've, uh, the stories that I tell about it, they're all constructs. They're not the thing itself. I can't, I can't, I can't, hmm. but I can use metaphors and I can use similes and allegories and mythology, which is, so here's the thing. What I discovered in divinity school was that that's what everybody does. That's what Jesus was doing. That's what Lao Tzu was doing. They're all using allegories and metaphors and myth and similes because they can't say it. Nobody can say it. You can only experience it. And so I think, I think my favorite teacher of all in terms of expression is Rumi. Rumi, um, has, he's, a, he's a Sufi. His, his use of poetry uh, gives access to all of us uh, to the experiences that he had mystically. They're not the thing itself, but the beauty of the language and the structure and the flow of the language creates a, an image in the mind and generally are often a communication to the heart where the resonance exists, where you know that, oh my gosh, he's speaking for me. And so what I'm trying to do with my language um, is find a way to bring, to use story to embody the unembodiable, to bring it in a way, let, let, me, let me put it this way, is one of my favorite painters is Cezanne. 
And when Cezanne painted the same mountain over and over and over again, if you look at his art, you see this is true. The other thing he did all the time was leave white space. So when you look at his art up close, you'll see parts of the canvas he didn't paint. It's not like he painted white. It's like he left white space. It's just not, okay. there's nothing there. And, and for him, that was a meditation form. He brought himself into the divine presence. And when I, when he's painting it, you could say the same thing about Bach or, um, uh, 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 oh my gosh, Love Supreme, uh, uh, oh, I can't, I never think of this trumpeter's name. He's my favorite trumpeter in all the world. Um, Famous American jazz trumpeter from the 1950s. Louis Armstrong? No. Uh, Black Eye, Love Supreme, uh, Heroin Addict. Jeez, and he was brilliantly brilliant. Um, I can see a love, picture of him in my head, actually, but too, I can't but I, get his name. I can't get his name. When a person enters into the space of the divine, and you can hear this in the song Love Supreme, you can hear it in Bach's music, you can see it in Cezanne's painting, um, you get to feel the what they were feeling in their presence of the divine there's this weaving that happens and so what i'm trying to do is weave into language the the thing that i can't say what a hard task for you to have to do <laughs> yeah i do anything else if i if i could and i'm glad mm. you said that because you know if i could do anything else with my life i would have i didn't have it's like i came back with this um, I wasn't, it wasn't asked, like, I'm, I, I'm in an agreement to do this, but when I came back after my NDE, it was no longer like a choice. It was a, a, an, a compulsion was driven by this noise inside me that would never shut up. I knew and you were going to say compulsion. Yeah. Uh, that's a common thread there for some reason. You feel compelled to do something. Yep. Interesting. Now your alien, sorry, not your alien, but your baguette, um, imagery where each of those had skewers and each one of those was a life was there an alien baguette piece meaning well, meaning hmm. that one of those costumes was an extraterrestrial it, it, it's possible i don't know there was i only i couldn't see into all of the worlds but i went into two of them and in one of them i was definitely a human being a long time ago with a bunch of guys walking down a road and in the other one, I was like some kind of lizardy thing. And so way back before this human form, I'm in some kind of lizardy thing. I don't know if I'm a dinosaur or a gecko or I'm an alien on another planet. I don't know. Dinosaur's oh. better than a gecko, in it? I would, I would yeah, wager. probably. But but my my brain was super super small, and so I didn't have a lot of capacity for self understanding. I knew that I was hiding. I knew that I was in the shadows. I knew I was among what I took to be leaves. My vision of the world was through eyes that I've never seen through before, uh, different shapes and colors. Was I on another planet? I don't have any idea. Was I back in time in Earth? I don't really know because I couldn't tell. That being said, I've seen three UFOs in my life. I chased one in 1977 with a bunch of guys in a car. So I do those things that they say, you know, stay still, making uh, right angle turns at high speed, mm -hmm. uh, shooting off at incredible speeds, all those things, you know, we're definitely not alone. This is the height of arrogance of religion, I'm going to say, okay, religious height of religious arrogance that we are super special because we're not. No, no, we don't. The sun doesn't revolve around us and all that stuff. <laughs> it does not. Right. Life review. This is the other thing I wrote down. Um, how did your life review present itself and how fast would you say was it over from start to beginning? Sorry, uh, start to end. Uh, well, when I entered, so this, this, when the light in filled me and surrounded me, I saw all of these parts of me that I described to you uh, and more. I understood that I was created creature. I, I saw the origin of this soul part of me, this baguette part of me. I understood, I could see it coming out of the darkness and being formed. I knew that it was constantly being called into the now, into being. And as that was happening, I took a, an understanding I was creature. I had a human shape again. And I was an illuminated being of light, but it wasn't light from me. There was a, an eye of God that was like a fire, um, an all piercing fire. And it was, it was seeing all of my life. It's, and it wasn't just seeing my life. It had experienced all of my life as me. It was like, 
it it had li- it had lived everything I had lived, and as it is as it it's seeing every component of me. So here I am. I'm I'm this human shape, and this eyeball is staring at me, and it's there's light outside of this human shape. It's re- is resonant outside of it. Uh, there's no physicality to it. There's no molecules to me or cells, and 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 as I'm being seen, and I know that I'd always been seen and always been known, and that the 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 experience of my experience was the experience of the divine. There was this little tiny shadow part of myself, and this shadow part of myself were all of the things that I had hidden from others, and some that I had tried to hide from myself from my misdeeds. And this this dark shadow part of myself was somehow located up here in the shoulder, and I was trying to hide it from the light. Like you can't look in there. Um, and and as I try to hide it, I call attention to it. And as I call, as if it couldn't be seen anyway. But I had this sense that oh my gosh, now now is all you know. Now you've seen it, and and I fall into that darkness. And inside of that darkness, I have this experience where I. I am all of the people that I hurt in my life in a chronological order. I am inside their bodies and I'm experiencing their emotional and psychological reactions to all of the things I had done to hurt them. And I am also, so super positioned again, I am also myself, my human self, as inside re-experiencing all of the causations for me causing them their pain. My, you know, whatever, jealousy, anger, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going through this chronology, um, you know, them, and this person was always switching was my sister and my brother and my mother and my father and my friend. And I'm like, just me, 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 me. And I'm all this pain and all this pain that I gave them attached to me. It turns out that as I, I, it was all mine. And, And so I'm suffering. I was suffering all of the pain that I gave away. And there was this magnification factor to it. So inside of this me that's going me, 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 literally me, 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 it's all about me, 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 me. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that the pain that I gave them is this big, it's the size of a peanut, but it turns out to be the size of a bowling ball. And so it, it's a, for every peanut, I thought a bag of peanuts. Now I've got a, I've got a truckload full of bowling balls and I'm being crushed by them. And the, the, the weight of the pain that I gave away, it was all attached to me and it was all this selfishness. And as I'm, in this uh, fiery, I call it a purgative fire of divine love. So I'm being, I'm being burned. It's like a, a, a hell. I'm being, I'm suffering all of the pain that I gave away, but the voice is speaking to me and it's saying, I love you. I know you. I've always known you. I've always loved you. I've loved you when you've done all of these, all I, I love you. And I get this understanding that it's that the, the, the divine is also in the same way that it's me, it's all of these other people too. And so it's not like looking at their lives. Oh yeah, they're flipping through the pages. Look, oh, look out on page 107. They, no, it's the page itself. It's the, it's the lettering on the page. It's the experience of the divine inside of them, always knowing me. And as this is going on, speaking love to me, I see, I see all of humanity. So I have this experience where I, I am shamed. I feel this shame for myself in comparison to this unlimited purity, which is only speaking love to me. And I see all of humanity as the same as me. There's this limited nature to us with a little lowercase l, and there's this radical equality between all of us because of this radical difference between us and unlimited purity. And so we are one, one brokenness and that the, through all of us the same love is still present and the voice communicates to me that I didn't design the universe I didn't make this place it's not my I, I'm just a little tiny spot in this space time continuum with the a septillion galaxies and 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 planetary systems I, I'm like nothing in comparison to this ultimate form and be and even though I am nothing in comparison to this ultimate form, and there's this radical equality to all of the universe and this level of limitedness, so magnetars and, and uh, pulsars and quarks and muons, they're all part of the same limited nature of this entire structure. It's all beloved. 
it's all beloved. I'm still being loved. I'm, I'm, I have caused all these problems and I am still beloved because I didn't make the system. I am made of the same divine love energy. And as I sensed the love that was, I had given away in my life and had collected in my life, as that became the lens through which I could hear this love being spoken to me, instead of focusing on the me, 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 oh, woe is me, my shame. Instead, I turned to the love itself and then I was infilled. I was expanded and infilled and all of my suffering was gone. And I, be, I was healed and whole and well and beautiful and love, joy, peace, paradise, knowledge, understanding, mercy, adoration, bliss. And I expanded like a helium balloon filled with all these truth, all these things that we separate out here, which were this unit, it was a unitive field and it became me. And I was this, I was the light itself. And, and, and then I had the other parts of the experience I've already described to you, the singular photonic thing. And I tell the story in a sequence, but I was in timelessness. There's no, there was no sequentiality to it, not the way that we have here. Uh, they were, I've given it form and structure in order to think about it and talk about it. Mm. Here's the question that, that has arisen, right? So you have a life review, you're shown the pain, that you give out and you experience it from both sides or whatever. Yeah. From, from you giving and, and being in the receiving end of it again, what would you say to what end? Because it would suggest that it's a learning experience and you'd have to go back and do it again in a reincarnation manner. That's what I would suggest. What that means is we're on the road to becoming perfect people. Is that the goal? So that, Every single life that's lived, everyone makes 100% the right decision every single time so that we don't do like pain. Or is pain a part of it and we must do it like? I think that my goal isn't my humanity incarnations. I'm not working on my humanities. I'm not working to try to be a better person here. That's just the result of the of the process of non-attachment. Uh, when I when I was traveling through these other heavens, these other levels of heavens, and this other mystical experience, that's my goal. That's where I'm after, and I think that that's the actual soul's journey. This is a way station for us. This is so. What like, you were saying then? This makes no difference down here whatsoever. Is that right? Uh, Am I reading it correctly? Sort of yes and no. Because everything is made of the divine light and love, nothing is ultimately lost. But if you want to continue to stay in this on the karmic wheel of suffering, then go right ahead. No one will stop you. It's I not, don't want to, by the way. <laughs> no, well, me neither. Um, that's for sure. I'm the last, if I could not, if this could be my last life, I'd be all for that. Can it please? I'd like to be done here now. Thank you. Um, but if I have to come back, I will. Uh, my, I don't think it's about being a perfect human. I think it's about perfect or as perfectly as possible as accessing the light inside us. It's not about trying to always make the right choice and be the best person. That's the result. The, the purpose is to, for me in my lifetime now, as I live it, is to uh, become as non-attached to my egoic self and the story that I tell myself who I am inside my head and about my life uh, to uh, uh, to create a capacity inside myself for more of my original self, my higher self, my truer self to become present to my lower self. And that is what has happened to me. That has been my, that's what happens. That's where I am. And, and so whether I have, whether or not I have to go through the, the flaming sword of hell again and, you know, have my karmic uh, sins detached from my body through the divine fire of love. So what? I don't care. I'll go through that in a second. I'll be, I'll be, I'm, I'm there. You take you, you know, no problem at all. Um, my understanding is it's not about my human life at all or the number of lives I've lived. That's the, that's the, that's not my goal. I don't think it's any soul's goal. I think that that's part of the illusion here is that you think you can be a better person when all you, when you have genetics and environment and uh, 
you have to work with what you got. And some people come in, they're, you know, they're predisposed to be narcissists or they're predisposed. It's like the, it's like the question of, of homosexuality. A lot of people in, uh, you know, 20 years ago and still today say uh, it's a choice. It's no freaking choice. It's genetics. You're born that way. You, you got brown eyes. You, you came that way. You've got a, you've got a, uh, uh, autism. That's what you got. And so you gotta, you gotta work with that. Um, but it's, you got a beautiful it's, face. You got to work gotta, with it. You know. <laughs> you know it's, well, you know, we do have a prejudice for beauty, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Us two specifically. Nobody else. Um, I believe that millions of people, right, have these NDEs, like you've just had, or you've had twice. If that's the case, it's not a fluke or flaw in the system. One would assume. So why do? You, so many people have or need what I call path adjustments. Why oh. do they exist? Do you think? Well, I think lots of people have path adjustments and I think you had one when your Nana came to you and visited. I think it was a, a, a matter of degrees. So maybe that path adjustment was one degree. Maybe my path adjustment is 180 degrees, but it's still degrees and it's still an adjustment, the course of the direction of life. So there's always been near death experiences. I attended this lecture once where this professor from Europe, uh, his specialty was uh, a near-death experience was finding them in ancient literature around the world, oh, Tibetan cool. and uh, Indian. And so he had this long list of, of near-death experiences, which were so unusual that people wrote them down. They were, they were fairly rare. Um, nowadays, they're not rare anymore. Why? Because medical technology has developed cardiac care primarily, mm that is bringing people back left and right. You get paddles all over the place. You've got injections, you know, you've got these. So we're actually, we're actually creating near death experiencers because we're not letting them die. I and see. so the 10 to 20 million in the United States, same in Europe, same in Asia uh, on a percentage basis, we're somewhere between five and 7% of the population, according to Pim von Lommel, who's a, who's a surgeon in, then Belgium, I think, who researches NDEs. Um, there are more of us for sure now. And why do we need a path adjustment? I totally got a path adjustment. Everybody who comes back has a path adjustment. Um, and I figure this, this is not something I know, but this is something I speculate. Mm -hmm. And I speculate that everybody's subjective experience, and there are variations in NDEs, but there are also uh, unions, like things that we all experience or similars, similarities. Um, I think everybody's given the experience that they need to make the adjustment that they should and in and their, and their life. And so I think that the divine is, is compassion itself. I experienced it as compassion itself and compassion gives us what we need. And, and, you know, if so many, you might ask this, uh, the question that you asked was, why do so many people need a path adjustment? Well, maybe yeah. everybody needs a path adjustment because humanity historically ha uh, hasn't really changed much in a hundred thousand years. We are, we are, we, we were prey for the majority of our hominid existence. We developed brains because of food and, uh, and evolution and tools. And then there was, the, finally came this point at which we became the dominant species. And when we, and we, we had become tribal in order for our survival. And as we move through history as these tribal groups, you know, we haven't really changed at all. You just have to read history. Just, history is the recording of war. That's what it is. Yeah, it's victors and all that. Yeah, that's, written that's by right. Them. Hmm. So I wouldn't say that only some of us need adjustment. I'd think that the whole society, the whole planet is way too much animal and not enough divine. And so That's a nice way of putting it. Yeah. Thanks. And I, and I thank you. I, 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 I'm hoping that the 20, you know, say this is just a guess, say there's 60 million near death experiences in the world today. And always some are dying and some are being made again, new ones. Um, maybe we have an opportunity to nudge the world in a new direction. Cause you know, the shit's hitting the fan here, even without all the stuff that's going on in Europe and in the United States, um, just climate change alone, that alone is, uh, I live in a place now where 
the, I live in a fishing area where the Southern fish are inhabiting our waters now and the Northern fish are moving up to the Arctic mm. and, uh, and, and, and spring's coming a month early now. So that's going to cause lots of social dislocation, new societies. What changes a culture? So you get a corporation that has a culture, you get a city that has a culture, and the culture gets passed on generation to generation, even though the people who started the culture are dead. Cultures maintain structure. They change a little bit. But what changes a culture radically? Cataclysm. Cataclysm. And, and so we're, we have an opportunity in the face of cataclysms that are coming at us, even if there isn't an international, you know, mutually assured destruction, nuclear war, even if there isn't that thing, we're in a, a catastrophic period of human history where tribalism, uh, which has never shown itself to work effectively for the benefit of all, uh, might be able to be nudged in a new direction. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a utopian enough to think that uh, it's going to be all flowers and roses. I, 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 I think that we have an opportunity to change the people who are around us to influence, not change, but to influence the people around us individually as near death experiencers, as a collective, because along with this religion and mythology is being shattered along with aliens. I like, you know, when they show, when they finally show up here in a way that everybody's going to be like, Oh yeah. Right. We're in my lifetime, world. please. Yes. I'm into that. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm here. I'm with you. Um, we need that. Uh, we all have an opportunity to create a society that's based in divinity, not our animal nature. Yes, and that's a lovely sentiment to end that part with. Um, I want to ask a couple of questions on an ego level for you. Are you fed up with telling the same story, your story over and over again? And are you fed up with the questions? No, I love the questions. When I tell my story, I go back there. And, and I knew, I knew when I came back that I was going, that the only thing, the only thing I actually have is my story. That's so, and that, and that isn't just a communicated, it's for myself. My, when I tell my story again, I go there again. I'm not there in a the full sense, but I have a, it resonates inside of me in a way that makes me feel illuminated. And in that illumination, I find solace, I find peace, I find connectivity. Um, I like to take breaks from telling it for sure, but I, but this in the same way that I don't want to ski every weekend like I used to, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, know? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know. I still love it, but uh, but I love the questions actually because the questions help me explore aspects of my experience that I haven't thought about before. I'm still learning. This is near death experience. Isn't something that happened to me, you know, a long time ago. It's a living daily unveiling. It, it keeps showing itself. The more I mine it, the more it reveals to me. The layers of the onion again, it's a puzzle that you'll never solve, but you like working on. Well, I'm sort of compulsive about working on it because it feeds me. It's not no, that it's fine. not that yeah, it's it's it makes me feel grounded in the world. Here's a question I asked somebody else who we discussed this topic. Knowing what you know about the I'll go back to it again, the hierarchy of the universe or the heaven or whatever you want to call it, are you happy with how it is? <laughs> you know because we have this perception don't we of heaven is this or it could be that are you happy with the reality of what you believe it is i don't believe what it is no you know what me all. are you what you know yeah. it is yeah i um yeah I, i'm happiness is not something that i experienced over there bliss paradise happiness is more like an emotion more like sadness here i didn't experience sadness over there either I, I had I had beauty. Beauty is this beauty is this expansive reality of of I don't know how to explain it. This big long sigh of relief. Um, but as for here, 
uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's beautiful. I live in a beautiful place. There are beautiful things that happen. I, I, I find, I find intellectual inqu inquiry to be fun. Uh, I like, uh, using my body. I like, uh, my friends. I like, uh, make a love. I love all the things that are making me a human being. Um, I, I don't like the suffering so much. Um, I've had a lot of it. I'm sure you have too. I'm sure everybody does. Everyone has, yeah. Everyone is. No, it's the great equalizer. But uh, I recognize that my suffering has often brought me uh, more light. And that if if this place didn't have suffering, why is there suffering? Well, it wouldn't be here. It, it, the limitation of it is the structure of it. And the structure of it includes death and decay. There's no death and decay. It's not here. It's heaven. And then it doesn't exist, this world, this universe. It, it's not the only universe either. It's, it's the one that we're in. Um. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> when you start thinking of that, because how can the mind comprehend that? Now, you wrote your book, Heaven is Beautiful, that one behind you, how Diane taught me that death is just the beginning. Um, you wrote it a lot later, didn't you, than your experience, from your experience. Oh, yeah. What then made you write it? Well, I, it took me 20 years to integrate. Okay. It took me, uh, I, it was a, it's a long journey and I needed to understand myself. I kept it a secret. I, my wife knew, but I kept this entire thing a secret for 20 years. For 20 years, I finally came out of the closet. Um, I was working as a minister uh, kind of working as a secret agent mole inside the church, uh, not a believer. Oh, I know. And I tried to help things along, but it, <laughs> anyway, there's a whole, whole lot of stories to go with that. Um, but I was working in New York City. I, w I had a TV show here in local market. I had two minutes every morning uh, to tell an inspirational story to 30 million people a year. And I was working in New York, also New York City with a bunch of networks. And I was at this dinner one night and I was still keeping this secret, but we were somewhere down, I think in like the lower East side. And I had, I drank too much. I'm not a drinker, but I think I had like three glasses of wine, which is too much for me. And, and I mentioned to somebody sitting next to me, oh yeah, I died when I was a kid. And the cold, there's like 20 people at the table and they all shut up and they want to hear my story. And I've been working with these people for you know a few years at this point. So they all knew me all from all over the country. And, um, I told my story and at the end of this dinner, the main producer for this main network I was working with uh, said, you got to write that down. And I'm like, no freaking way am I going to tell this story? Mm. I'm telling you guys and I'm sorry that I told you. Um, and so they, the, the, it, was, it was this group called Faith and Values Media, which used to be Hallmark Channel. And they said that they would produce my book trailer for the book that I was going to write. And that they all oh, they all ganged up on me and 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 like uh, get bought you more wine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so they produced this book trailer, and then that kind of locked me into having to actually write the book. Um, and so then I wrote the book, and I didn't. I, I um, well, I wrote. And then the, the book rest is it, history. It's like it and there's your story out in the wild, wild world. What did you learn about yourself through the process of writing that book, if anything? I learned that I could be the writer I always aspired to be. Oh. Um, that the scariest thing about telling the story, besides um, the, the bravery it took to risk my social capital among my family who didn't believe me or my friends who didn't know, um, it was, I, I, I found that two things, I found that I was co as courageous as I always thought I was. And, and two, that, um, my, my biggest fear with the book wasn't really coming out of the closet, which I had been doing incrementally for a decade at this point. I just didn't think I was going to be doing it on such a large level, um, was that I was afraid that I would suck as a writer. And I've been, I was an English major and I love literature and I read, you know, great writers and I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to be panned for my writing. And I know that sounds egoic and it totally is, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted, I was afraid for that. And so the thing I learned about myself is that I, as a dyslexic kid, as I mentioned, I, I uh, if I set my mind to something, I could do it. 
No, oh, cool. Yeah, do it. I mean, that is the message, isn't it, to everyone anyway? If you're thinking about doing something and you have that compulsion and you want to do something, don't let fear or risk get in the way. Not risk, don't let fear get in the way. Risk it and actually do it. So well played to you for actually, you know, walking through that door at the end. Um, how was it received and did it lead you to anyone or an organisation or something that again took you down a different path in life? Has it opened oh, yeah. new doors for you? Oh, it totally did. Um, it became an audible bestseller. It's being made for, into a film. I've been working with these producers oh, cool. for three years and I'm nearly finished my end of the contract with them. Um, that'll be done in a, hopefully in the next month. And um, yeah, it led me to the International Association for Near-Death Studies. In uh, Seattle. I, and well, they're in, they're in Seattle, but they're actually, their main office is in Maryland. Um, it's And it's an, a consortium of university-based uh, professors and doctors and, and researchers primarily that historically have uh, examined near-death experience for 40 years. And I, I love science. I'm a, I, I, love, I, I read a lot of science. I love it. And so it was sort of a natural thing for me to go to this where I discovered my peer group. I had never had anybody like me. I never knew anybody really like me. Um, and I found a lot of people led me to a lot of new friends, uh, people who who shared near death experience. And so I don't have to explain things to, to them. They just know already because they've been mm. there. Um, and so that's a fabulous thing for me. Um, and definitely has opened new doors. It opened this door to this movie and um, these producers, one of whom is a near death experiencer. And it is a, another opportunity for me to under the, the, the forge, the iron forge and hammer of their critique to improve my writing style. And so I've spent a, <laughs> it's been a three year critique and, um, and trying to reach the mass market because, because really what I'm, what I'm trying to do is by doing all these interviews quite is to uh, try to encourage other near death experiencers to speak up and to bring this into the public spare, square for a public conversation about this thing that every, all sorts of people have experienced mm. um, and not to hide it anymore. Because in that way, once we can talk about it, and I thank you for having me on the show and all the other NDEs you have, um, because the more it's spoken about, the more normalized it becomes, the more normalized it becomes, the more opportunity we have to nudge society into in a the new right direction. direction. Yeah. And I think what with Netflix and all these other platforms, having more of this content on there, that's mm -hmm. driving it more mainstream, isn't it? And so it sure is. I, I love that. Right, we're gonna take a sideways slant now for the last part of the uh, the interview. We are now entering the Coit Zone. Coit Zone! In the Coit Zone, I ask you irreverent and silly questions. They're just for a bit of fun. We end in a nice positive, um, non too mental way. You know what I mean? We lighten the mood. So, uh, can you sing or play an instrument? I have been known to sing in chorus, but uh, no instruments. Not, not as lead, though. Not as lead, no. They say, go on, get in the back. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do. Give me someone to follow. If I'm standing next to someone I can follow, then I'm great. Not yeah, let's hide in behind Lane Jim. <laughs> That's right. That's right. What, what food stuff is your downfall, i.e. it calls to you? What food calls yeah. to me? Oh, yeah. uh, my wife made this fantastic Spanish stew with beans and spinach last night with some focaccia. That's what's calling to me. What's focaccia? I don't know what that is. Focaccia is a is a bread. It's a kind of a flat Italian bread, uh, very dense. It's uh, with parmesan on top, baked with parmesan. It's uh, that's what's calling to me. Warm with butter, uh, olive oil. Warm oh, with all, okay. all, olive oil. Mm -hmm. I haven't had bread for a while because I'm on a carnivore diet, so I don't I don't have bread. Uh, but no, yeah. I Good do miss you. it with yeah yeah I do miss it though with jacket potato. You know when you can get all the oh lovely oh I shouldn't think about that. Have you ever seen a ghost? Yes. Can you quickly tell the story of it because I love yes, ghost I, stories. I was a a, a practiced stilt walker in parades. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was my shtick for a long time, and I was. Uh, this particular parade is called the pumpkin fest parade and it spans two towns right next to each other. And between these two towns is a short bridge. And under this short bridge is a tidal river 
because we live down by the ocean. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of flow that, that goes underneath this very narrow space. And the year before, a couple of years before, uh, they're called Shriners. I don't know if you have them over there. And they're part of they're a, a, a civic organization with funny little fez caps, like uh, like a, like the Turks wear. And um, the but they drive go karts in parades. And uh, and so it's, it's, it's an American yeah. thing. It's, it's right? new to so, me. Yeah, go on. It's, uh, so <laughs> so they do tricks on these go karts. And this uh, year or two before, when I'm still walking, uh, this guy on this bridge. They had this little ramp. He was supposed to jump over this ramp. Well, he miscalculated and flipped over, and he died in front of everybody in a in a terrible mess. Crikey, yeah. And um, and so I'm I'm still walking in the parade a, a year or two later, and I and I know this because I because uh, I read about it. And so I'm walking down the hill, and I'm and I'm trucking on my stilts, and kids are running through my legs, and I'm dressed as a corn stalk. I've got huge corn stalks sticking off my my hat, and I've got corn stalks all over me, and I'm having a blast. It's super fun for me. And I get to the bridge, and I'm crossing the bridge, and I'm in the middle of the road, and on the left hand side, I see two of my neighbors, um, from my town, a couple towns away. And so I I take all I have all this momentum. I I stop. In a, like a quick stop and I swing my leg. And as I swing my leg, I step forward toward them. So I do this pivot. I do a pirouette. I do a pirouette with all this momentum. It was one of my, my classic moves. And then I, I know how to stop myself like on a dime boom, and lock in place and stay in one for balance for a second. But the day before I had to repair my stilt, I have a bolt in my stilt that my foot stands upon and I put a new bolt in, but I couldn't find the correct gauge. I went one gauge down in the bolt size and I figured it'd be fine for one parade. Well, it turns out it wasn't. And so as I stop in front of these people on this, they're sitting on the sidewalk and there's this railing. And as I do that, my stilt breaks. And as my stilt breaks, um, I, I, I have all this forward momentum because I was going to stop. And now I've got all this forward momentum and I have this, this experience where, I, where a couple things happen at the same time. I see myself going over the, I'm in myself. I see myself going over them, over the top of the railing, headed toward the water. Like I just have this, like, this is my vision. I see them like, rushing toward the water. And as this is happening, um, I also pop out of my body. I pop out of my body and I see behind me this gray floating mass and it's floating up by me. And, and, and the next thing I'm back in my body again, and instead of being in the river, I've collapsed straight down, which w made no sense. Mm. And so I collapse straight down and I, I twist my ankle. Uh, so I get a little sw uh, swelling in my ankle. And, and, and meanwhile, everybody's gasping, <sighs> you know, cause everybody, you know, they're, they're in this place where somebody else had died. And two of these guys, this one guy I went to college with who lived near me and his protege lacrosse, protege, they stripped off their shirts and, and uh, Sam was on one side and George was on the other. And they were like on the railing going about to go in after mm. me and uh, to try to rescue me. Cause I was wearing my stilts are made of wood. And, um, and so instead I collapsed to the ground and George, my buddy, and we calm everybody down. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm sorry to scare you. And my still broke. And we walked back up to his car, which was nearer than mine. And I'm sitting in the car and my phone rings and, and I pick up my phone and I'm like, hello. And she says to me, this woman who is a near-death experiencer who had been suicidal for, uh, because she was a paramedic and she was at all these scenes of car wrecks, um, she was seeing dead people, hadn't been, I counseled her out of suicidality over a year. She called me on the phone, hadn't talked to her in a year. Um, what just happened? I said, uh, what do you mean? She said, well, there's a, a dead guy here. And he, and he said, he wasn't trying to harm you. He was trying to help you. And, um, and then he, he kind of stuck with me. He stayed with me for a week or two, kind of like traveling around with me um, until I finally fit, learned to tell him to go to the light. And then he left. And so he, this Shriner guy was part of my life for a couple of weeks. Yeah, very, very odd. I know. Weird experience. <laughs> um, here's, here's the thing, right? I just want to see if we can get these uh, our screens back on the right side. So it says you've raised a hand or something here. Oh, oh it's a bit, yeah, there's a Zoom <laughs> thing that happens. Sorry, there's, there's a, a new... Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, when you were classic corn, Peter, 
um, on your stilts because you were that corn guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did right. you have did you have a voice that you used to do? Yeah, my voice my voice was uh, don't touch my stilts. <laughs> Don't touch my, my stilts. stilts, guys. Don't touch my stilts. Run through my legs. Don't touch my stilts. Um. <laughs> Classic corn, Peter, that one. Do you have a favorite animal? Uh, chickadee, which is a little bird uh, that is uh, indigenous to my area. And we, I have an affinity. We have relationships, not like sexual relationships. When I say that. I realize that's a terrible thing. Obviously not, yeah. Obviously not, because they're really small birds. Uh, but I, uh, I, we have a... An ongoing, the whole the whole species of them sort of like me. And so I have a visitor comes inside my studio, two or three of them come in and say hi uh, when the doors open. I love that because that tells you a lot about a person when animals like to come up to them. That's what I think anyway. So well played. Um, if you could travel to the future for a day, what would you do? Where would you go? I'd be on an interstellar warp speed spaceship going to another planet um, for yes. exploration. Does that mean you're like a Star Wars, a Star Wars, Star Trek sci-fi guy? Oh yeah, I'm totally into all that stuff. Well, I'm not, I'm not like a, I don't wear the badge, but I've been, I've, <laughs> uh, it, but yeah, yeah. Good. I have actually got one of those badges, and I did used to like pressing it and doing all that stuff. But hey ho, <laughs> is there a part of you that annoys you? Yeah, my my dyslexia drives me crazy. Yeah, that's fair. Is it not improved over the years, or it just is what it is? <laughs> It is what it is, and I've I've developed all sorts of techniques to compensate for it. But my techniques take time of my life in order mm. to you know be organized with it. If I that's the that's the bugaboo for me. But there's nothing I can do about it. it's genetics. No, so again, it is what it is, isn't it? What can you do? Um, what type of music really speaks to you? Uh, jazz. In a good way. Oh yeah, I love I love I love I love the complexities of. Uh, the and the expression from the soul of the of the musicians. Uh, that said, I was listening to George Harrison yesterday um, from one of his earlier albums. Anybody who's the music that really speaks to me is soul music, and and so jazz is my favorite. But if if there's soul inside of the music and I can hear the soul, I like it. Yeah, cool. Like you can feel the emotion of it, that sort of thing. Yeah, lovely. Um, have you ever been attacked by an animal? Yes, I have twice. Um, I was laid on by a grizzly bear. Oh, geez. And, and nearly suffocated. Um, and then I had a, a tussle with what's called a northern goshawk, which is a very large bird here. Bird, and yeah. I actually got a physical fight with it. Um, Who and, won? Uh, uh, it did, but I didn't get all <laughs> cut up and I escaped. I, I won by escaping. Were you trying to steal its fish? Was that what you were doing? No, I came too close to its babies. I was looking at, ah, I, was out, I was out bird watching and I got too close to, I didn't even know where it was. I didn't know it was there until it started screaming at me. And then I was like, from, from me to my speaker here, like, and I'm like, oh, I should take this opportunity to really look at it. And um, then just pissed <laughs> it off more. <laughs> and what led the bear to lie on you or whatever? Well, I was leading, I was in college is year before is the year that I died, but be, months before I was leading with two other guys, a backpacking expedition in the outdoor club up into what's place, a place called the Grand Tetons in Wyoming, uh, high elevation mountains with a lot of grizzly bears. And we did all our grizzly bear stuff. You, you don't sleep in the clothes that you cook in, you hang your food. We did everything correctly um, because there are freaking grizzly bears and you don't make mm. a mistake. That's why. They and eat so, your face, literally. Yeah. They do. And so in the middle of the night, um, we're, we're in my tent and it's a two person tent, but the three leaders were all sleeping in there together. And there's enough room for all of us to lay on our left shoulders. We had an agreement. Everybody sleep on your left side. So we're all kind of canoodled together in, in our sleeping bags. And in the middle of the night, I, I hear this snort outside. And when I hear the snort, it's very loud snort. I feel the guy next to me. I know he heard it too. Cause I feel him go uh, like this as I go mm. uh, like this. And all three of us are wide awake. And then this, this big, huge thing touches my for my head like this, like this big of a nose, and it touches my head, and I know it's a nose because it's sniffing me, and it's yeah. like huge on my head, and then it slides all the way down my 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 shoulder, like on my armpit, down to my butt, and as it slides down, it's leaning in on me, so it's like its body is on top of my body, and I can feel that it's thick fur. But it weighs, I can feel that it's huge. 
and uh, and it sniffs my butt and it sniffs down my legs and it sniffs my feet and it goes past my feet and then it rolled over on top of me and pinned me and pinned my buddy and pinned the other guy and this tent was not didn't have strings on it it was a, a freestanding tent with aluminum poles so the tent lay down flat on top of us and this bear was lying on us flat and we're like and now it's lying it was lying there so long that I couldn't breathe. And so I began to become asphyxiated. And so I, I'm getting lightheaded and I can't, I can't breathe in. I can't move. It weighs like a freaking thousand pounds. And so I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't move at all. And that included my lungs. And I felt like I was breaking and I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. A bear is going to suffocate me to death. And I thought, oh my God, that's freaking embarrassing. First of all, and not even be, you know, to be mauled, just to, three guys dead. How did they die? Um, <laughs> a bear led on them. Yogi bear as well. <laughs> right. And so then it, it rolled off and it went away. And we're that, like, <gasps> and that must so have then, put the shits right up you, mustn't it? Oh, oh my God, we were we were petrified, and plus we had to go out because we had all these other people with us. So we had to like wait and and then go inspect the area, and we we're really super quiet. And we didn't tell anybody, and we were scared shitless. And 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 the next day we hiking out. So we hike out. It's a Sunday or a Monday. I think it's a Monday because it's it's a holiday weekend in the United States. So we get to the parking lot, and there are fifty guys there with guns. Like the parking lot is filled. There are rifles. There's this guy. I walk up to this guy and he's got this revolver. And it's silver. I can see it in my head. It's got a, it's a revolver with a pistol with a barrel that's this long and a caliber as big as my eye. Mm. And, and I was like, what's going on, man? And he says, oh, didn't you hear about the grizzly bear that killed the woman on the other side of the mountain? We're come here to hunt it and kill it. Oh, geez. We're like, oh, my God. And uh, so that's my bear story. I wonder if it was the same one that killed that woman, had it spit well, on, then uh, led on you guys for a rest. Well, that's kind of what I was, that was the, the deduction that I reached, that he didn't eat us because he didn't need to. Because it was full, yeah, full of lady. Jesus, that's one hell of a story. You know, that worries me, Bears. I went to America not long back, and I kept saying to my girlfriend and her mum, I don't want to get eaten by a bear. Please, no. And I never saw one, which is amazing, but that worries the shit out of me. <laughs> um, what's the one film that you've seen the most times in your life? Oh, it's A Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. And, I, and oh. I, I've watched it a thousand times. Uh, it's, I don't watch it anymore because I've watched it a thousand times. But it's a, a, a story of deep spirituality. Yeah, it's a well-loved film, that one. My mum loves that one, yeah. I know the one. Well, that is the end of the Coit Zone. Thank you for coming through that with me. I have two final questions, and I kind of think I know the answer to this next question. What else do you like to do in your downtime? Any activities or guilty pleasures? I uh, am a cyclist, and I, I now have an e-bike, a fat tire e-bike, and it's awesome because I live in a rural place, and I live on dangerous roads. Country country riding is dangerous because everybody drives fast, including me. Uh, um, now I have access to the gravel on the side, and it's super fun. How long does it give you, like range-wise and time in that? Well, I live in a hilly place, so I can get maybe 25 miles, um, and I'm, I'm going to get a new battery, an extra battery. But if I lived in a flatland place, I could probably get 40 miles. A decent, decent, decent lifespan, and it saves you having to – Cycle up hills and stuff. Yeah, and I'm aging out. I've got I've got old. Uh, you know, I've been being an athlete my whole life. I've got things that that having an e-bike assistant on my knee is a good thing. Yes, yes, I know what you mean. I I, I play football a lot, and uh, you find pains and aches everywhere. Oh yes, and they never seem to get better with age. <laughs> no, they do <laughs> always not. get but worse. But you're still playing. You're still playing. I'm still playing. Um, maybe I shouldn't, but uh, you know, you know, once you're in love with something, you just do it, don't you? Regardless. Yeah. Right. Last thing. What are you currently working on? I'm finishing up the last chapter for this movie and I'll be meeting with my second producer, who's the lead producer, um, in order to get his notes and probably adjusting the end of this story, which will um, become my next book. And hopefully I'll be going to my new literary agent this in the next couple of weeks uh, and getting an advance so that I can take time off to write this book, which has also been optioned for a film and a, and a sequel. Oh, Ace. Well, I hope those go amazingly well for you. Um, and when they get released, I'd like to see them. So if you remember me at that stage, whenever it may be, just send me an email, say, oh, here it is. And I will go and look for it because I am interested in the topics. 
Well, I'll be doing an email blast for my whole list from Jure. <laughs> Spam ahoy! <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. yeah, super lush. Look, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, it's been a lovely conversation. I've learned a lot again today. You've told me a lot of things that I've not heard before, and I like that. So that's always a win in my book. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, everyone watching, check out the links in the description, links to Peter's site, uh, books, etc., etc. So go and check those out. I'm sure he would appreciate that. And Peter, thank you ever so much. Thank you, Coit. To watch other Coitcast episodes, please click the image top left. To subscribe to my channel, please click the image top right. Please like and share to help Coitcast grow. And most importantly of all, please click the notification bell so you never miss an upload.